pleasure. Thanks for asking. Yeah, this is really exciting for me. It's something that I haven't publicly really spoken about, but I, I'm slowly finding more and more is, is my mission, is part of my mission. Um, awesome. I'm not sure if Jenny told you that, you know, we, I have a career podcast and that I'm writing a book on career for young women, young adults, but, you know, also young women um, to kind of steer them away from like vain professions, surface professions, the fashion industry essentially, and to try to get them to really explore um, math and science, but also just purpose-driven work um, from earlier on in their lives. And um, bullying for me was a huge impediment in my growth and a huge um, roadblock for me that took many years, many different cities of living in, many different versions of myself to realize that I have been severely traumatized through what happened to me um, in my youth. And um, this is something that Jenny and I have been talking about, but Jenny had just asked if I was on um, TV, which I had told her I had briefly been on TV in front of millions of people, but um, then she said she looked it up. So yes, I was on um, America's Next Top Model in 2006, 2007. And um, it, was, it was a crazy experience, but it was very damaging. And it was very, um, it was very much in line with uh, bullying, mm -hmm. um, so to speak, because you have, you know, you're rushed into this process, you have no control over your edit. And then if you don't win, even if you're a strong competitor, you get the card of, I was the villain or the, the bitch or the not nice person. Um, right. I very much see myself as somebody who was strong and independent and didn't let other people bully me, um, which offends a lot of people. And in today's culture really does get called the bitch a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I did get a lot of my strength from my youth. But with that being said, the repercussions of having a villain edit on a reality TV show seen by millions of people just further perpetuated the bullying from my youth and really right. sent me into a pretty huge downward spiral um, excessive, um, you know, party life, excessive, um, uh, dating the wrong guys, um, just perpetuating abuse further in my life than I needed to. And mm -hmm. so I really wanted to like open up and just talk to you guys, I guess, let's just start by introducing, um, both of you. I'll let you guys introduce yourself. And then I guess we could just jump into some questions, but I really just want it to be an open conversation about bullying and what we can do about it and how we can nip it in the butt earlier. So it doesn't ruin people's lives. Love it. Okay. I can go first. I'm yeah, Jessica first. Elliott. <laughs> I'm a middle school counselor at the moment in Prince William County Public Schools. And I'm currently working at Reagan Middle, middle School, which is in Haymarket, Virginia. I've been a counselor for 15 years and I've done elementary, middle and high school. And the last few years I've wanted to focus on bullying. So that's where Jenny jumped in and it all just came together. Mm -hmm. And we, we started a, Jenny wrote a small group format that addresses bullying. And then she was running a small group and then I ran one with her at a Franklin Middle School, which was in Chantilly, Virginia. And then I ran one last year at Reagan Middle School. So these were both with middle school students. I love that. And Jenny, go ahead. Okay, and um, I'm Jenny Mitchell. I am, I have a PhD in educational psychology. I'm right now teaching and researching at Oxford College of Emory University. And my, main focus has been and continues to be perceptions of bullying and cyberbullying. I also look at coping strategies that are effective as well as self-efficacy beliefs and ability to carry out those coping strategies. So um, as Jessica said, um, about, it was probably five years ago, four or five years ago, I got involved with Peyton's project and they asked a psychologist to work with students from elementary, middle, and high school to come up with solutions on how to address bullying at all their particular school levels. 
And the psychologist last minute dropped out and they, they didn't know what to do. And I said, you know, I'll, I'll just run the group for you tonight. And when I went to the group, what I found out immediately is they didn't necessarily want to talk about solutions. They want to talk about experience because oh. they joined the group because they had experience. Sorry. Okay. You broke up a little bit. What what would what did they want to talk about? Oh, sorry. They wanted to talk about their own experiences. Okay, yeah. With bullying or cyberbullying. So I continued to meet with them. And the more we met, the more it became evident that this was something adolescents needed as a, a way to connect. And they also needed strategies to tackle or overcome the detrimental outcomes from bullying or cyberbullying. And miraculously, in comes Jessica. She was um, highly recommended by her stepmom. And it, it was like a beacon of light when she came onto the scene because she added so many wonderful components to it. And she's really taken the program and it's taken off due I to love her. That. Yeah. So what exactly is Peyton's project? It's a program that you do at these middle schools and high schools. I, I, for people who don't know about um, Peyton, um, she's a young woman who committed suicide. Is that correct? Correct. And if you've seen that movie, The Social Dilemma, you, you would probably have joined me in crying when they said that the cutting and suicide rate among girls is up like 150%. Right, right. Um, so yeah. So what exactly is the project, the Peyton project? You wanna to speak to it, Jessica? Sure, okay. it's, it was created by Peyton's parents and they wanted to take her death and do something really good for everybody, for the world. So Peyton's project has, um, the mission is to stop bullying, to help anything, so Peyton also had a concussion. So they think that added to what happened to her and how she handled the bullying and how she wasn't thinking correctly. So just basically education for people to understand how the teenage brain works, how bullying can really impact the decision-making of teenagers, and then most of all, how to help teenagers. So that's where Jenny wrote Jenny can speak to the curriculum she wrote, but that's she and I have been implementing this curriculum with students now to see, we tweak it as we go and add to it and take from it as we go. Cause like Jenny said, the kids just like being together and they like having that common bond. And that's, that's where the magic is. You got to weave the kids together. Right. It's not about the curriculum. I wish it was, I wish that was the magic I thing, know. but it's really about getting these kids together. Right. And it's tough. It's the hardest part in getting these groups together is getting the kids to agree to set foot in the door and take that first step. Cause that's, that's admitting that they have an issue that they need help with. Mm -hmm. And that's getting them to feel safe enough to walk in the room and meet with us. So well, it's been a lot of fun. I think, um, I think, so just to give everyone a little brief synopsis of what I went through, I already told Jenny a little bit about it. I'm not sure if you shared it with just fair or not, but I was extremely bullied in high school for my weight. I was very skinny. Um, it was a problem because it wasn't seen as something socially um, that mattered for bullying. The teachers were in on it too. So um, I got called anorexic every day from the time I was about 12 until I was 18, every single day, multiple times. I got harassed. I had things thrown at me. I mean, it was horrible. Um, then when I started to get taller, um, many, many, many people would say, you should be a model. You should be a model. So my mom and I went to like a model search and I ended up getting a modeling agency, which really pissed a bunch of my girlfriends off, um, which turned, I was also a very goody two shoes kind of girl. You know, if there were drugs or boys or anything bad, I would alienate myself from those people to not get in trouble. My mom's 100% Italian. I was very afraid of her growing up. Um, so I didn't do anything bad. I, you know, I taught Sunday school. I was a very good girl. Um, and that just further alienated me. Um, and it, it kind of all came to a head in my junior year when I got jumped by six girls 
they um, basically tried to kill me in, in front of about 50 people. The main perpetrator, um, her mom worked at the police department. She, nothing happened to her. Um, and it was, it was vicious. It was brutal. It was, um, it was very scary. I looked at private schools all summer. And then my mom and I decided that I should stand up for myself and I should go back into that kind of lion's den and just like stand my ground. So I did that. I, I worked in high school. So I, I luckily wasn't in school in the morning. So I only had to kind of take the abuse a few hours a day. I ended up finding really great best friends. But at the end of the day, it, I felt very alone. I didn't feel like anyone related to me um, on the bullying thing. Had there been a program in place in the school, um, I probably wouldn't have had so much depression, so many negative um, thoughts on myself. I would have been nice to hear someone say, it really is not your fault. It's mm -hmm. inappropriate for people to put their hands on you or to say mean things to you about yourself that you can't change. But instead I internalized it and then further perpetuated it by com you know, competing on a national television show that was international actual actually, and then was villainized in front of millions of people. So it perpetuated further bullying from the media. Um, and I, there just was never a system in place within the school. There was never a counselor that when I talked to them that there was a way that they knew how to deal with it. It was just kind of like, you should be you should be grateful you're so skinny you know like most girls just are jealous and want to look like you it's like i can only be told i have a disease that i don't have so many times before i start thinking that i have a disease um right i've never had an eating disorder um my mom refused to put me on weight gainer because she thought it would screw up my metabolism which i'm grateful for because you know i did have a very good modeling career because it, maintaining my weight was not a problem for me at, um, and living the lifestyle I wanted. But at the end of the day, I suffered major mental implications from this harassment that I felt like no one was protecting me. So I guess when you say, yeah, having other kids around that are going through this, it would have really helped me. Um, but I will say this, that had there been social media, which all we had was AIM back then, which I avoided like the plague for people that I went to school with. I didn't add them on it. Um, I talked to like strangers on it. Cause I was like, Ooh, you know, like, this is so cool. I can talk to other people. I think I was looking for just a way out of my social scene, but had there been social media, I'm scared because I don't know. I think I probably would have become a cutter. I probably would have become somebody who um, contemplated suicide and um, because they're just, it was relentless and it didn't, it, kids are very cruel and it, it just didn't stop, you know, and you just would have done anything to make it stop. And you don't want to tell your parents, you know, I got to move schools or do this. But when it, when you get beat up by six girls, then your parents are like, should we move schools? <laughs> so I didn't have to say anything after that point to try to get her to look at that option. But it was also too late. At that point, I was 17 years old. I, I like was just so sick of it. And I had got grown a very thick skin from it, which helped me in the modeling industry, which is also very abusive. But I will say, I'm not, I'm worried about these girls. I'm worried about girls, you know, girls that are watching this right now, they don't, re you know, it's hard to see that 10, 15 years down the line, you're gonna have an amazing life with amazing people mm -hmm. around you. And you're going to do amazing things and help people and have an, an awesome time because it's hard to see through that tunnel. So I guess I'm scared for these young women. And it's, you know, Jenny, you said there's really no way to totally end bullying, you know, to completely get rid of it because kids will be kids. But I, and I think you said people who are bullied also tend to get into this vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So I guess, can we talk a little bit about like what happens to people when they don't like get nip it in the butt as a kid to know that this isn't their fault. And then even though we can't stop it totally, like what can we do as just like people that are in the community who really aren't connected to too many kids? Right. Do you want to go jump. first, Jessica? Yeah, you want me? I can okay. jump in. So what you can do in the community is mentor kids. I, I would love to have community mentors for my students and I never have enough we try to have staff mentor them, but there's only, you know, I've got what, 100 staff and 1,500 kids. So mentor the kids. 
that's so needed because at this at the teenage in the teenage age they don't want to listen to their parents but they'll listen to literally any other adult that's in their life so <laughs> funny it's so true <laughs> it really is because they're trying to separate from their parents which very natural thing and then what was your other question because i thought um, i answered i guess you. i guess yeah like do you see that this is like really affecting kids on a large scale i mean the social media is so gross you know like the way that kids have to be perfect i thought i thought social dilemma displayed it pretty well with the girl like staring in the mirror like i'm never gonna look like this photoshop or this snapchat filter what should i do and the girl's like beautiful you know yes yes so yes there's been a huge increase of depression anxiety increase of our students being hospitalized for depression anxiety suicide attempts um it's unbelievable my the beginning of my career i hardly would ever have a student hospitalized. Now it's, we always have a student in the hospital. It's heartbreaking, oh. completely heartbreaking. What's working though is, I feel like I'm lucky. I've been in some really good schools. So what works is when we find out that there's been bullying, we call in, we, we talk to the student of course first and then follow up with the parents and make a plan together because when you, leave the student out of the plan, it's never gonna work. So you've gotta do what they're comfortable with and you've gotta meet them in that moment. But I can call in resources like, I have a great police officer that's assigned to our school. So if there's cyberbullying and it's bad enough where somebody's being threatened, then he gets involved immediately and he can get into those accounts and he can take care of it from a police standpoint as far as keeping kids safe and that. He can also educate kids on the dangers of cyberbullying, and he's really good at it. He has great examples from real life that have happened, and I'm really thankful for him. And there's a lot of great police officers assigned to schools that, that help. I also get the parents, of course, and the administrators involved so that we can, if there's other students that are hurting this particular student, we can start having those conversations. And my school uses, we do restorative practices, which is restorative justice. So we look for community building and long-term relationship building, like how, so restorative practices are how can we repair the damage that's been done in this case. And so we involve all, all members and, and parents as well. And that's been very successful, but you really have to keep the student as the center of your focus and what they're comfortable with. And it's hard because at that age, they're not comfortable with anything. You know, yeah. they're like, nope, mm -hmm. it's fine. Just brush it under the rug. I'll deal with the emotions behind closed doors, but that can lead to very toxic self-damaging behaviors. Right, which, so me as the counselor, I'm constantly checking in with that student. And as the relationship builds with us, they start trusting me. And my hope is they start sharing what's going on and I also get to know their friends because the friends will come tell me what's really happening out of care for their, their friend. So that's what's working. But again, getting them plugged into a group has been incredible because then they feel like they belong and they're not being singled out and other people have the same struggles at their age. Right. I mean, it would be so great. You know, I would, I just volunteered for big brother, big sister to, and I told them that, you know, it would probably be good if they give me someone who's been bullied because I'm good at like <laughs> kids who have been through that. But um, it is, I do think it would be great if like there was an easy way for members of society who have been bullied to kind of volunteer with the schools. Mm. I mean, that would be, there was something that made it easy to do that. It's just hard when you're dealing with kids, you, you, you do have to go through a lot, but I think it's worth it. I think there's a lot of value in that. Absolutely. I love using big brother and big sister mentors because they come, they go through a screening process. So they're always good. And they also are covered legally with yeah. big brother, big sister. So I don't have to worry about that within the school system. Yeah, I think it's a good way to kind of, if you're someone like me who has been bullied and you're, you do want to volunteer, I do think that's a good program. They do the background checks, they, you know, they do an interview, they really look hard at matching you with the right kid, but then you can also volunteer at school. So 
Yeah, I also teach junior achievement at middle elementary, middle, and high school. Mm-hmm. Teach financial literacy to kids. I think that's something that needs to be started in elementary school as well. Um, and um, and that has a little bit of a process, but I think I think you know all, both of those programs are great. But I I I still am like we got to do more. Like this is so scary. Yeah, it's yeah. a never-ending process. Right, because it's almost human nature, right? I mean, it's like the, the what you had told me was, um, what, what was it that you said? Uh, um, the social dominant theory. Oh yeah. Where, um, like it's the nature to pick on the special kid. You know, the, the, like that's what you said. You said like the kids who are being bullied are really special for some reason mm-hmm. and other people feel inferior to that and then they kind of gang up to bring that person back to their level right right and they notice uh research has shown a spike in bullying cyberbullying when kids transition from elementary to middle so jessica you tell me if you've seen this too and then once uh, once they find their place and their social status it tends to decrease a bit but then it rises again when they make that next transition and even working with college students, they've seen the same thing, even in college. It's just, it's more difficult for them to define it or point it out because they, in their mind, they tend to perceive this as something that happens in high school or middle school. Although when they describe the situations happening, it's still bullying and cyberbullying. It's yeah. just, I mean, it's, it's almost like adults I know we talked a bit about adults because if you go on social media sites where adults are, people are horrific to each other, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they're very kind and loving as well, but also adults are not being good role models. No. Right? And they, they wouldn't necessarily say it's bullying. They would say, oh, we have different perspectives. And they have a veil of, of protection because they're on fake sites. I mean, I'm cyberbullied. Right. The reason why I don't have a million followers on social media is because I changed my name 37 times because <laughs> when I hate, I think people laugh, they're like, why don't you have more followers? It's like, I don't want more followers. More followers brings more pain, you know? Like, like these people are mean, you know? I still, t- it's been 15 years since I was on TV. I still get people saying horrible things to me. Um, I had a death threat last year. I had to have the police come to my house. I had, for something I did on an edited game show, reality show. So I had to have, I had an email come in with a death threat. I have had people on fake sites say nasty things. Then when I delete the nasty things, they come through their real account and say, oh, you're just the person who deletes my comments because you can't handle the truth. It's like, you don't know me, you know? And that's the problem with social media and yes. the internet is that you don't know me. and and who are you to go out there and attack other people? Like you, people are so miserable that they have to attack other people. And mm-hmm. the problem is when you're on the receiving end of those attacks, it hurts and it takes work. And so for years I was like, I don't have the energy for this. I just want to improve my quality of life, you know, at this point. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be in the public eye. Um, And that's why I stayed out of it for so long. But now I feel like actually maybe my voice is good to use it to something like this, which is this is inappropriate and people need to stop trolling and stop. You know, these are the people who raise the bullies. You know, the people when you see the bullies in school, you're like, well, let's look at their home life. They're probably being bullied at home. Yeah. And this is something that I had to talk that I told Jenny when we talked before that I had to tell my family very openly um, a couple times, like, I don't like being the butt of jokes. I don't like teasing because I have dealt with enough of it, you know, and, and I don't want it at home too. And that's hard when you, and I had to say that, uh, you know, as a teenager and as, a, as an adult, cause I come from a very loving family who likes to tease each other. But for me, it doesn't work because I'm traumatized by it, you know, and I, yeah. and, and I accept the trauma, but it's not going to continue to hurt me, you know? Yeah. Right. I think, Mel, you really hit it on the nose with the trauma background. Any bully, if you understand what's going on in their life, they're dealing with trauma. They're dealing with trauma in the wrong way. And they're aiming it towards a weak, what they perceive as a weaker person Mm -hmm. to make themselves feel better. 
So when I'm working with the students, we get to the point where we start analyzing what's going on in the life of that bully. And then I'll, it's really interesting because in the school community, maybe the victim doesn't realize what's going on, but maybe that bully's had a divorce recently, or maybe they've lost somebody, or maybe they were actually bullied when they were in elementary school, which is actually what I found most is that the bullies were bullied. They're either bullied by peers or by siblings, somebody in their lives. They're just continuing that cycle. And then getting the kids to realize that it's not really about them, the victim. It's really about the trauma the bullies faced. That's when you start to see the growth and the change and the transcendence. Yes, because that's when they realize it's not their fault. Exactly. Yes. Beautiful. That is beautiful. And I do think, uh, Jenny, when you said to me, you know, the first step is getting these kids to realize that it's not their fault. Right. And I think another, you know, I've been working with ACEs a little bit, not only in my own life, but we had the ACEs um, podcast last week. So you guys will be this week. So we're kind of combining the two. You know, a lot of kids are suffering things that will affect them long term and manifest into physical representations mm -hmm. in their adult lives because yeah. of things that happen in their home life. And I do think, um, like you said, Jenny, bully, per bullying perpetuates itself. So whether you become a bully or continue to be bullied in your adult life, it's going to keep going mm -hmm. until you sit down with yourself and realize like, this was not my fault. I am not to blame. I'm not going to take the blame. I told Jenny that the girl who beat me up messaged me like years later. I mean, 10 years later or something on Facebook. And she's like, I just wanted to say sorry. And I showed my mom and my mom and I were like, what is this? You know? And my mom was like, my mom and I were like, she's probably pregnant. You know, like she probably is like the one bad thing she did in her life. And she's probably like, doesn't want it to be karmically inherited on her children. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to write this response. Um, you know, well, I was going to wait 15 years to accept your apology, but I am not you, you know, and I was like, no, you know, if you're going to forgive her, it would probably be really good for you to actually forgive her. And okay. so I sat with it for a little bit. And then I sent this response, which was very much, um, you know, I'm sure I played a role back in that day. You know, I don't blame you completely or, you know, I'm, I, I'll take some of the blame, but like, it's cool. I've had an amazing life. I hope you have too. No hard feelings. And I truly don't hold like angst or anger towards any of those girls. I was friends with them all at one point. And because I chose to take the mindset that this attack from these girls was actually my motivator to have the strength to leave and then to live in six countries mm -hmm. and 15 cities and have the strength to go on a TV show for this thing. Like it gave me so much courage and so much fearlessness because once you have that happen to you, you're like, well, what's the worst that can happen? Six people jump me, you know? So, <laughs> so you kind of go into everything with this fearless attitude. So I always saw it as like a semi-positive, but it's still at the end of the day hurts. And, and there is that hurt that I didn't deal with where I was like, okay, I'm going to take part of the blame. Whereas the reality was I shouldn't have taken the blame. That was disgusting what they did to me and telling her that I took the blame took off tried to take some of her karmic pain off of her because I still am a loving person. And that's the thing that Jenny, you said, you said kids who are bullied are special. They're more sensitive. They pick up on other people's emotions and they're game changers. So at the end of the day, when you're being bullied, do you identify with that, that you're a sensitive person, that you are someone who picks up on other people's emotions? Because they probably tried to bully other people who just were like, whatever, you know, they, they didn't have Absolutely. the sensitivity to accept what people were yeah. saying to them. But I don't take the, I'm not, I don't take the blame, you know, like that was wrong, you know, in every way. And at this point, I'm like, I think it's very sweet that I like gave a kind response and I did forgive, you know, her. But at the end of the day, if you're being bullied to the point where you get attacked by multiple people, um, you, like you need to, have enough therapy or a counselor or a friend or family work with you to where you don't put that on yourself so it perpetuates. 
Definitely. Right, right. You got to get to the point where you can forgive and you realize that the forgiveness, like you said, is really more for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you trying to take some of that blame, that's incredibly generous. That's, that's not needed. So I can right. tell you've done so much work on yourself. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, I still have a long way to go, but I will say that we all do. (laughs) Yeah, we're all works in progress. Yes. And that's the thing, like to grow, to live is to grow, to grow is to live. Yes. But I like that you say you need to realize it is not your fault and Mm -hmm. you need a support group. You're not going to get through this alone without it damaging your future. You know? Yes. Have to find. And for for kids, their support group needs to involve other kids because mm-hmm. that's developmentally where they are. Yeah. They're, yeah. yeah. They're developing those bonds with peers and they're starting to break away from their parents. Yeah. So and they that's, think, that's yeah. they think adults don't understand. Yeah. So uh, all the bullying programs, or if you ask most educators, what is the number one thing they tell kids to do? What's the strategy? Tell an adult but they don't tell an adult until it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's too late. Exactly. And I will give them the piece about social media that we don't understand their social media world like they do. No, Mm -hmm. not at all. No. And I I joined everything and I still don't quite get it. And I I own that. Like Mm -hmm. I'm an elder millennial, okay? I'm born in 1983. I'm technically the first year of millennials, which is nuts. But the reality is I was sitting with my cousin's daughter, who's I think 13 or 14. She was snapping, like I've never seen someone snap so fast. I mean, she was like a computer in a person. And I was just like, this is wild. And she was telling me stories. And I was just like, oh, it's just a different era. Definitely. The same generation can be so separated. Mm-hmm. Exactly, yeah. And they lose that real connection. They think it's a connection. Right. Well, right. that's very real. That's yeah. Dopam- it's dopamine oriented. Which- yeah. Definitely, definitely dopamine oriented. Yes. Right. So if you can switch them to getting their dopamine in another way, that would be ideal. But they're right. getting their dopamine online. Right. That's exactly right. So really, a solution is find one friend who is really gonna like be a nice person to you and listen mm-hmm. to you and and. Mm-hmm you have a safe place for communication and start a friendship and you'll probably be able to maintain that friendship for the rest of your life. And one good friendship is better than 30 jerks who are gonna abuse you the rest of your life. Absolutely. And And that friend will stand up for them online too. Yeah. And that's huge in their world. They need that. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I don't even think about it, but you know, my, so my senior year of high school, we were in homeroom and this guy who had been trying to talk to me for like years came up to me and talked to me. And I was like, why are you talking to me? And he was like, why wouldn't I talk to you? And I was like, he's like, I always try to talk to you. And I was like, because no one talks to me. I go to school with 2,500 kids. No, I'm like the outcast. Like, why are you talking to me? He's like, cause you're, I think you're great. You know? And I was like, you think I'm great? Okay, let's be friends. And this guy He was from South Africa. He lived behind me. I ended up picking him up from school every day. I mean, I can give him and maybe two other girls a lot of credit for getting me through my senior year. But I had like the freshmen who were the sisters of the seniors that were bullying me, like talking crap to me in the in the hallways. And after I became friends with this guy, like we would be walking down the hallway and they would be doing it. Freshmen would be bullying me. And he would be like, <laughs> and like, <laughs> he would be like, <laughs> you know, and like, like he would literally bark at these people. And he like was my dog. Like he like literally protected me and ushered me through my senior year of high school. He like kind of like exposed me to things that I otherwise wouldn't have been open to before I had been outcasted. But if it hadn't been for him and my two other girlfriends who kind of stepped into the role of being like, we don't care what other people say about you, you, we know you're a good person and mm-hmm. like, we're going to stick up for you. I, I just don't think I would have gotten through it, but those people are out there and mm-hmm. they have been probably trying to be your friend for a while. Um, and they'll protect you. I mean, he was literally barking at people for me. That's a good friend. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 
I mean, he's like, I'm going to bark at every freshman <laughs> senior who thinks that they can t- treat you like that. And it was like an angel coming from the sky. But I think that I, I just don't, I think in this day and age, you need to like make sure that those people are on board for like, let's combat this. Let's not, um, let's not like leave this person alone to deal with this. It's so, you know, this person has great things to do in their life. Um, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's hooking the kids up with a support network. That's huge. Mm-hmm. And what do you think about people who are like, want to pursue a career in like bullying? Like, I do think that we were taught when I met, met Jenny, I was surprised when I went on LinkedIn and I was like looking for, um, and when I went on the internet, I was like looking up bullied programs. There actually wasn't a ton of resources and a ton of um, professionals who devote their life to this. So like, what do you guys think is the right way since both of you are devoting your life to this for someone to kind of enter this work, this career as a career? Because there's a multitude of ways you can do it, right? But what do you guys suggest? Jenny, you want to start? Well, what I <laughs> what I would really like to see, I mean, there are quite a few researchers, but there's not as many as maybe researchers studying STEM or um, other fields. So I, I know more and more people are getting interested in it. But what I'd really like to see is a bridging of the gap. And I've talked to Jessica about this. I'd like to see research meet up with educators and counselors so they can come together to really find solutions to help help educators on how they should handle these situations, as well as students and parents. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also difficult because there's no uh, universal definition for cyberbullying. And the definition for bullying, which is uh, intent to harm, repetitive, and an imbalance in power, researchers are now talking about the fact that we need to switch this definition to better incorporate what's going on. So I think if we could all come to some sort of consensus on how to define the behaviors and what's acceptable and what isn't, and then how to address it. That would be very beneficial, especially for educators, policymakers, for when they're creating laws or different policies for schools. And fundraising too, right? And fundraising. Because research is directly proportionate to funding. So if you don't have enough research, you're not gonna have enough funding. That's right. Great. I always tell young women like research, becoming a scientist and like doing research is an amazing profession. It's, mm-hmm. it's a long-term career. You make great money. There's not a lot of women in that field. So you mm-hmm. are unique, um, which you're used to being if you're being bullied. Um, but I also think that I, um, the, the, the research that, like you said that the, the, the definition is repetitive, but to be honest, I've been traumatized by cyberbullying with just one interaction. So that right. that's unfair. You know, if someone threatens my life um, and I have to get the police involved yeah. and it's a one-time thing, right? That is traumatic. Yeah, so, so that's why, and they struggle to define that because is repetition just one transgression, but yet then it's reposted over and over as well. I mean, that can that can definitely send somebody into a tailspin. So there's that, there's also imbalance in power. So you you don't necessarily know who that person was that sent you that message, right? So is there an imbalance in power? Yeah, because they can look up where you live, they can look up, you know, or where you work. It's very scary. Right. But also these are adults like this is a this is also adult this goes for adults too and i think that that's what's that's another thing that's fascinating is that you actually have adults who are getting away with bullying on such an extreme level you know i did some research on suicides from reality tv shows and i counted a few articles it was like over 30 people since 2005 have committed suicide that participated on reality tv shows um, there's been multiple books written about the abuse of this um, this form of media, not just for the people who compete in it, but also for the viewers that it traumatizes them and how damaging mm-hmm. it is 
for people um, to become public when they're not financially prepared for it, emotionally prepared for it, um, physically prepared for it, uh, just you're not positioned right in society to ha be a public person on that extreme with a bunch of biases labeled to you. And uh, we're only, it's only gonna get worse um, until we change the format. Mm -hmm. But it's scary, you know, adults are also dealing with bullying that they don't even realize that they're dealing with bullying. Um, right. And a lot of a lot of the bullying that takes place is illegal, oh, but yeah. it gets swept under the carpet as bullying or cyberbullying. Well, I mean, also let's be totally honest, which this is taking it to like another total extreme. But one out of how many people are actually prosecuted for rape? So if you can if you can be yeah. physically violated by somebody and they still don't go to jail, there's something wrong with our system. And that's the that's another extreme version of bullying, you know, and power dominance. But the reality is, all of these things are being perpetuated because we're seeing a higher rate of drug usage, depression, suicide, STDs, all these things, which mm -hmm. are physical manifestations of traumatic childhoods. Right. So it's something that really serves our society, our economy, to like nip in the butt. But yet, it seems like there's not enough resources. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Resources are key. And then in the, in the schools, our funding, our classes are big. We've got, you know, over 30 in a class sometimes with one teacher mm -hmm. and who knows what's going on behind the teacher's back. It's funding is key, but well, the teachers, I mean, how, what do you have to do to become a teacher? You know? Yeah. And then the expectations now, once you become a teacher, you just don't teach anymore. Right. You're combating bullying. You're well, now they're dealing with pandemics and teaching online, and that's that's a whole nother discussion. But it's underpaid, right? Absolutely, right. Turn the nicest, sweetest person into like a demonic like. <laughs> I, that this is scary. But also, we're not really even competing on an international level with our intelligence um, right. coming out of our public, you know or private schools, to be honest, in this country, which is very scary because we, we now compete on a global scale in pretty much every major city that we live in. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, those jobs are gonna keep dwindling away, which is why it's really important to like combat these issues that are, they are physical real life issues that kind of manifest into mental health mm -hmm. issues. Exactly. It's a exactly. big issue. But if anybody is interested in pursuing a career in helping with bullying, I highly recommend school counseling. You're in the trenches. I'm helping kids constantly. And so that part is extremely rewarding. Mm -hmm. Like I know I'm making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I know going to work every day, I'm going to make a difference in someone's life. And that's, that's huge for me. That's why I love it. And I keep going. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think both of you are doing it from really interesting perspectives. And and I think um, we need both sides equally. But I, I do think that working with the kids one on one, um, if you have the energy for that, and the mental, I don't know if it's something I could do, because I've been so traumatized by it that I would just be like crying all day. They'd be like, why are you crying? You know, I'd be like, oh, it's just so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get to a point where you just become stronger and it's okay. Sometimes I cry, I get triggered. It's okay. And then you just admit why you're crying and it, you would be great actually. <laughs> well, I'll mentor for a while and see what goes. Awesome. <laughs> I, um, I definitely, you know, on this path of helping people with their careers and trying to get young women to see that, you know, being in entertainment and fashion is not necessarily the most fulfilling lifestyle choice. It's fun, you know, but it, it sets you down a path of a lot of further mental health issues. Um, with, you know, and if you love entertainment and you love fashion, what I always love is like, cool, develop your, I always say develop your intellect, you know, have something that can get you paid for your intellect and then have something that's a passion that you love to do that is like, you know, and like fashion or, um, you know, writing or in do your side projects and then have a physical thing that you like are trying to 
you know, pursue or that really keeps your body in shape. So for me, that's yoga. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so for my things are finance, financial advising, um, writing and, and the podcast and career helping young people and then yoga and th having those three things has really made my life, um, feel very complete in many ways. Whereas a lot of times you can find yourself spinning and not really feeling close to anything um, when you're in those kind of very surface professions, I feel like. So um, you can have those kind of things that you do. But I also think, you know, we are lucky women. We're the first generation of women, first, second, third generation of women who can not only travel the world freely, not during COVID, but who mm -hmm. we, can, we can really, we're allowed to develop our minds, minds and mm -hmm. contribute them to society. Um, yeah. I think that that's something that young girls need to hear. You know, a lot of times we end up being professionals in the things that we ourselves struggled with. Yeah. Right, right. So yeah. here's a fun fact. My undergrad is fashion merchandising. Uh, <laughs> I see a lot of fashion girls ending up in like um, mental wellness, actually. Yes. So for a hot minute, maybe a couple of years, I was in the fashion world and I was quickly, I found out what it was about. Yeah. And so quickly I said, not, nah, this isn't going to work for me. And I went and pursued the master's degree in counseling. Wow. How did, how did you pick the counseling? Honestly, I wanted, I had met my husband and I wanted to start a family. I was like, what can I do to have summers off? So I don't have to put my kids in daycare year round. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had been working as a youth group leader, volunteering. And so the other lady I worked with was a counselor at a Catholic local Catholic school. And she was like, you, you need to get a master's in counseling. You'd be great. I was like, okay, I'll, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And Jenny, what's your story? Um, so I was an elementary school teacher and at one point I knew I wanted to do something else. So I got a master's in psychology and I had always wanted to pursue a PhD because I had always wanted to be a professor. But then I got married and we, we moved to England. Then I had three children. Then we moved to Canada. Then we moved to, back to the States and I had another child. So um, I was thankfully lucky enough to stay at home with them. And then when my daughter was in kindergarten, my husband said, I, I think it's time you should probably go back to work. So I started teaching again. And then I, um, I was in a horrific car accident. I was with my daughter and I was driving her to a swim meet and somebody ran a red light and hit us head on. And then somebody from behind hit us. Yeah, it was, it was really bad. I, my femur was shattered. Um, I couldn't walk for four months. Thankfully, my daughter was fine. She had a few bruises. Ironically enough, was the only seat in the entire car that was not damaged. So um, wow. anyway, it was it was a really long road to recovery, and um, I've learned a lot about perspective and the effect that perspective taking can have on you. And I needed to find a reason why something so horrible happened, and I ended up. Well, I'm going to put it this way. We came to a mutual agreement because I was teaching at a private school and I was having surgery after surgery and it was really hard. And it was hard on the kids to have a teacher who was there some of the time and some of the time gone. So um, I met with a rehab vocational specialist. And during the time that I was at home, I ended up getting a bullying prevention specialist credential because I had written a middle school middle grade novel and it ended up being focused on bullying because I had some things that occurred in my childhood. I grew up in California, very fair skin. I was teased all the time and called an albino. And so I had some things happen to me as well. And I'm also very sensitive and um, was always in the process of standing up for myself. So this was really heavy on my heart and all of those things together, when I met with the specialist, he said, well, if you're so interested in this, why don't you get a PhD and get paid to do what you love? So I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. So I did it and I finally finished my PhD last year. So it was a long haul and I'm, I'm very thankful for that car accident. 
Wow. Oh my gosh. You know, I, I say it on the podcast. I write it on my social media. I will say the only thing that I am a hundred percent sure of is that the worst things bring the best things. Yes. It's the only thing I totally know agree. In life. <laughs> right. It's the, only thing. it's the only thing I can say that that I know for sure. And that is such a good example of that. Yeah, I feel I feel really lucky. I'm sorry I had to go through a car accident to push me forward, but and I wish other people would move forward without tragic events, which some people do, but um, but I'm very thankful. I think for most of us, it has to be something tragic and horrible to get our attention, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah. It's so true. There's so much good that comes out of these traumas and lives. And it's also, yeah. So a little more on my story to add to that. When I was 14, I was a freshman in high school. I lost my mom and my school counselor jumped right in and they actually had all of the counselors trying to get me to open up and they finally got me to join a grief group. And that was the best thing I ever did. It was the only time I was with other kids who had lost parents and that was huge for me and I never forgot it. So when my friend suggested I be a school counselor, I was, I said yes right away because I had that positive memory. Yeah, it resonated with you. It did. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I have goosebumps from both of your stories. My legs are like, going, it's like See, and that's why you're doing what you're doing and yeah. you're going to touch so many lives. Yeah. That I mean, for many years, I sat frozen. Like, um, I mean, I've, I've always been in motion trying to make something happen big with my life. But for many years, I just felt like, what am I doing with my life? You know, like, where is this going? You know, and it just kind of all slowly filled, found its way to the right way. And once I remember, I was really upset. Um, and my one girlfriend, oh, after I lost my dad. And um, my one girlfriend said, you know, just make sure you're going through what you're going through, you yeah, know, and good I, advice. It was really good advice. And she's my best, one of my best friend's little sisters. And my best friend was like five years younger than me. So she's like eight years younger than me. So I was like, I'm like totally open to getting advice from like kids at this point. Right. But I will say that <laughs> she, even like to this day, I think kids are full of intelligence and, and just so smart, but I, but she, you know, she's just, she's just a beautiful person, but I, it was like, it was like one of those things like God was like speaking through her because I was like, oh my gosh, that is so true, you know? And this is where my heartache comes in for young girls and young boys today, which is that a lot of them don't get through it yeah. and they, they, they leave um, or they, um, or they allow it to damage them so much that their lives are ruined. And I just think getting on the, just that little like millimeter past the end of the, that, that, that what you're going through, it's like the best thing. And then all these amazing things start happening to you. So you just got to get through it, you know? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And, and that was the same thing when I lost a parent and that was the same thing when I was being bullied and honestly getting, just getting through top model, which was defied your human spirit in mm -hmm. every single way. I mean, they probably have multiple like human rights, like they've crossed human rights many, many times on that show. Mm -hmm. um, and they're taking, you know, they're young women. They're, a lot of them are under 18, you know, or maybe they're just 18, but they seem, they're so young, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I guess they're adults, but they're not mentally at the place where they should be signing up for something that can damage them so greatly. And yeah. I, I honestly, I think we, especially the girls who are watching this, who actually were also on Top Model. I know a lot of the girls that have been on the show have suffered a lot, you know, and some are dead. Some have been to jail. Some have been on drugs. Some have tried to commit suicide. Um, it has been really hard on us. Um, really, really hard on, a, I would say all of us, but if you made it to the last five and you were on that show for two straight months being brainwashed, you have had repercussions for many years since the show and you have to see the good in it, you know, because if you just focus on the bad stuff that happened, you're not seeing where your purpose is and, and what you, what you learned from it, what you can contribute. Um, 
one of my girlfriends had something really bad happen recently. She's just, she's really, in, she's really feeling the effects of 2020. It's like one bad thing after the next. Mm. And I said, just try to remember that there's a rainbow after this thing that you're going through. There is going to be one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that hope. Lesson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instilling that hope is, it's key. It's what gets us through. Yeah. And it's fascinating because even if you don't believe it, it does happen. It's just mm -hmm. one of those things. And then eventually it happens when you get old enough and you've been through enough trauma and enough horrible things. And like, you're like, wait, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Every crappy thing that happened, there's like something amazing that came out of it. Exactly. And then pair that with an 18 year old brain who's not done developing till it's 25. Mm -hmm. right? And that's a recipe for disaster. But just the awareness, like I tell, I have a 19 year old and 18 year old and I'm like, your brains are not developed yet. <laughs> your decision making is not 100% yet. That's why you still have hits. Well, maybe that's but all. That's how Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't get the last part. Just broke up. I said I, that awareness that their brains aren't developed is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm just having like light bulb over my head right now. Cause I'm like, wait, you know, I was on the show when I was 23. I wasn't even fully developed and I was significantly older than all the other girls on the show. I even got the old card. Um, I had been through college. I had been in my first serious relationship with somebody who was 11 years older than me. You know, I had had my first job and my brain wasn't done developing. And, and that's maybe why so many people off of Top Model, I feel like have had so many issues because we were kids. We were still developing our prefrontal, and, yes. and 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 we don't. We thought we were adults, you know. Yeah. We didn't. And identity, yeah. identity formation is happening. Yeah, in front of during millions those of years. People. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, it's a fascinating thing to think about. And were any of us protected? I mean, I never got a single phone call from Tyra Banks. I gave her two months of my life. At, you know, t not a single phone call, N not a single one you know, and, and just, and also never, I, the only time they had me talk to a counselor was the, the, the moment I got kicked off the show, which I got second place. I, it was the only real time in my life. I thought about killing myself because I, I was so brainwashed. They had a counselor for like two minutes be like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, like, and then I went in this room and I hadn't been left alone. There were cameras around me for two months straight. Oh my goodness. Left me in a hotel room by myself. And had it not been for somebody that was on the crew coming to my room to make sure that I was okay, I probably, I was like trying to figure out, I mean, I was so brainwashed. I was so in it that I was literally like, should I jump off the ledge or should I like hang myself from the shower? Like, so, I have a question. So the whole time, even when they left you in the room without any cameras, you had no cameras on you. I had not, I hadn't been in a room without a camera on me for two months straight. There were 11, there were, there were three moving cameras at all time. Even when you sleep, there's a crew sitting with a camera. There's 35 cameras oh in the house. You know, there's a camera in the limo when you're moving. You're not allowed to work out. There, you're, you're too tired to work out because they work you for 16 hour days. You're, there's never enough, you never have enough food. I was one of the lightest contestants ever. Clearly I have a weight thing. I'm, I'm the opposite of someone who gains weight. I have to eat to keep my weight on. I went on the show at like 110 pounds. I, I am emaciated at the end. I was 95 pounds when I got off the show Oh my goodness! because we literally did not eat. And if we did eat, we were so exhausted by the time that they gave us food. I mean, it was like thing after thing after thing. One of the executive producers did come to my room right afterwards. I had cried so much that there was a mound of tissue next to me. It was like, I called it my tissue ship. Like, I'm just going to sail away on this, on this like thing. And he was like, I can't believe you're so upset. And I'm like, I, and that has always stayed with me because they thought I was as strong as I was putting myself out there to be. I was 23 years old trying to win a competition. Of course, I'm going to put on this like strength thing, but of course I, I buckled, you know, these were all, you know, you build up this thing in your head. It was totally detrimental and I'm a journal keeper. So I went through all of my journals. Like I kept journals from the time I was on the show all the way until now. And when I read the heartache that I suffered and the mental illness I suffered 
from the way that I was not only treated, portrayed and, and felt on the show, but the fact that I was just left to my own devices, not, not helped with my career, not helped with my mental health, that was a 100% direct result of the being on this show that I was not prepared for. I, you know, it, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to just think that there's people out there who will do that to other human beings. Yeah, I'm completely disgusted by all of that whole story. Everyone that, should be not disgusted. Acceptable. Not acceptable. It's unacceptable. Yeah. And we, we, how as a society do we, do we treat these people? We pay them tons of money to watch their shows and we give them money to make new shows and we empower them to, you know, Tyra Banks had a TV show about women, pitting women against each other. And then she went on show, had her own talk show trying to like empower people. You're like, and, and that ended up being a mess too. And you're just like, look, at a certain point, you have to understand that the way that you're creating media is damaging young women. It's damaging them. Yeah. It's and we have a social responsibility to not create media that further perpetuates abuse and teaches young people how to go out there and abuse each other. Why aren't there shows about women uplifting each other? I have a beautiful group of women. When I go on trips with my friends, we have a great time. When mm -hmm. my friends have kids, we are there for each other. We are each other's family. Where are the shows about that? Yeah, that's, what, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, all we see are these shows that glorify money and, and have grown women fighting physically on television. It's sick, you know? It's and that's because that's what sells and that's what people watch. And so we have to start glorifying the right things, which is mm -hmm. empowerment, loving mm -hmm. each other, um, right. and not commit condemning each other for the fact that we're acting out on trauma from our childhoods and when our brains were developing. This right. is like my whole thing is like, a lot of times in friendships, people, you know, it's hard to be like, you just lashed out on me, don't ever talk to me again. Instead of being like, where is that coming from? You know, yeah. what is that from? That's like not who you are. I don't want to deal with that again, but like, let's get to the bottom of where that comes from. Exactly. Perspective. Yep. yep. Sorry, that was a rant, but that was- No, a no, that's good. You, know, you should hook up with that guy from The Social Dilemma who's trying to make a difference. You know, to be honest, it, this is the first time I've publicly said anything about it because I'm not like, I don't have a vested interest in like talking about um, um, the way that I was treated on the show, except for the fact that it was, I was bullied again in my life. And, um, but that time, that was a perpetuation of abuse I felt in my, in my younger years. And, and I've survived it. And people should understand that even if you get bullied in elementary school for the way you look, and then you get bullied in middle school for being whatever that other people don't feel. And in, you know, and then in your adult life, you get embarrassed and villainized in front of millions of people. You know, I have been through it all. And I sit here today, very happy, very successful and with purpose in my life, very grateful I didn't do you know, have, you know, permanent solutions to temporary problems, even though the temporary problems went on for way too long. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. um, it's something that I'm going to continue to talk about and that hopefully we can all work on together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'd be happy to help you, whatever you want to do next. Yeah. I think, um, you guys have been so amazing. I'm really grateful for your time. Is there anything else that you guys want to talk, say, or talk about? Do you have anything? I uh, The only thing I want to say is it's not their fault. Mm, it's yeah. not their fault. And like you two were saying, find a friend, find a mentor, find something that you're interested in. I, I just want to leave with one thing. A friend of mine, um, Tony Arciero, he goes by Anthony Arciero uh, professionally, but he studies life purpose. Mm. And he said, what you do is you find what you're good at, what you enjoy doing, and find a way to share this with other people. And in the process of doing this, as we talked about, dopamine will be released mm -hmm. and you will be happier on a daily basis. Absolutely. Yes. And part of the small group counseling that we do, 
the last couple of lessons focus on kindness and giving back to the community. Mm-hmm. So same idea. What's your purpose? How can you move forward and help? I love that. And I always say like when I'm in a dark place, I volunteer, you know, yes. because if I yes. am feeling really bad about myself or really down on things, something that happened to me, I'm like, okay, just go and like help out at a, a, a meal kitchen or go to mm-hmm. go volunteer at your, wherever you worship or just volunteer because it gets your mind off of it. And I would say also for people who don't know what their purpose is or what they want to do with their life, just try a bunch of different things. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. thing that the, th- the way you'll know is when it's the thing that you lose time doing. So if you like try five or six things, but when you're drawing or painting, all of a sudden you've been in a black hole for eight hours, that's your thing. Yeah. So the thing that makes you lose time is your yep. thing. Absolutely. Find your flow. Yep. Yep. Nice. When I have students at school that are in a bad place, I'll hook them up and have them volunteer, have them help another student do something, just getting them in that give back. Makes you feel right? Yep. Yeah, that's so, it's so true. And I think as we, as you get older, um, we, we're, t- we're kind of like, we start realizing actually like giving gives the exact same dopamine release as receiving yeah. Maybe more. It's better. Um, it's mm-hmm. better. It is better. <laughs> yeah, it's better. And um, I love it when you see teenagers who get that too. Cause like, you're like, oh, they actually are the smart ones of their group, you know, like, or they're having, they have parents who really understand this, or they, they have a friend who showed them this way. Mm-hmm. So yes. I agree with you that finding peers, not necessarily just an adult or a mentor that can be your real friend, you know, and isn't mm-hmm. going to do bad things to you. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Oh, you guys are the best. <laughs> so are you. Yeah, oh, thank you fun so talking much. to you. Oh, we love you. Thank you. So much. <laughs> this has been so great. I really appreciate you making time so that I could get it up for our next podcast in line with ACEs. Um, and I'm sure all the women from our women's group are going to have a ton of questions for you guys. Mm-hmm. So if you guys can make it to our goddess circle on the 16th, I'll send you information for that. Um, but I want to just thank everyone, buddy out there who's listening. Um, if you want to be a part of our women's group, just find me on social and, and ask me to be added in. We've got a really amazing group of women. And um, I think we, we're all on a mission to do great things with our lives. And I just, I'm so grateful both of you could be available. Thank well, you. Thank you. This is really fun. It and was I'd fun. love to be part of that group. Hey, okay, perfect.